welcome everyone who's joined us in worship here this morning. We extend a special welcome to any guests who are among us. We also welcome those who've joined us via the live stream. We pray that the Lord will bless our worship and may it build up his church. Uh, there's quite a few announcements this morning. First of all, uh, nominated for elder, our brothers Phil Banstra, Rick Banstra, uh, Matt Dykstra, Steve Underwater, John Penninga, Bill Van Assen, and Ed Weringa. Nominated for deacon, our brothers Norman DeYoung, Ed DeRuder, Willie Hofsink, and Spencer Rapp. Uh, election of office bearers will take place on, Lord willing, on April 14th, 2024, after the morning worship service. Uh, next, with joy and thankfulness, consistory announces that the following brothers and sisters have been examined by the consistory regarding their knowledge and commitment to the Reformed faith. If there are no lawful objections, uh, the following brothers and sisters will publicly profess their faith on April 21st, 2024, Lord willing, in the morning worship service. Uh, Janelle DeRuder, Jaden Van Sprunson, Jamie Verhelst, Emma Went, Rylan Leffers, Jesse Plug, Jimmy Vandergag, Jordan Dornboss, Tyson Van Veldhuizen, Colby Work, Michael Venard, <coughs> Sarah Vandevelde, uh, Aaron Weringa, and Joel Vandermorn. Uh, next, <clears throat> church visitors will be in our midst, Lord willing, on Thursday, April 18th, as per Article 46 of the church order. If anyone would like to speak to the, to, uh, the church visitors, please contact the council as soon as possible. Uh, next, uh, the, this evening there will be a word and deed presentation in this church building at 7.30 p.m. You are all invited and encouraged to attend. Uh, then there will also be a coffee social following uh, this morning's worship service. And finally, collections today will be for Word and Deed. Next week, they will be for those in need uh, locally and abroad. So far, the announcements. If you're able, please rise for worship. Lord our God calls us to worship him, and the call to worship this morning comes to us from Hebrews 12, the verses 28 and 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let us now confess our dependence upon the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Receive the greeting of our God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's now sing a psalm of praise to God our awesome King, singing Psalm 97, stanzas 1, 2, and 3.
We are now going to read the law of God from Exodus 20. And as we read God's law, let us also remember it's another opportunity for us to rejoice in our Savior, for he is the only one who ever lived, who's kept these commandments perfectly, and he is our righteousness before God. So in that, with that in mind, let us now read God's law. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. <clears throat> Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. <clears throat> You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. For our summary of the law, this morning we're going to read from I'll read from Romans 13, verses 8 to 10. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Let's now also respond uh, to God's law with singing together uh, Psalm 97 again, but this time stanza 5. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven and our awesome King, we come before you with a reverence and awe in our hearts, knowing that you are the almighty and infinite God. Lord, as we look at this world you have made, we see your glory on display all around us. 
we know that it all testifies to your almighty power, your wisdom, and your goodness. And Lord, we stand in awe of your greatness. For as we look up into the heavens at night, we see also the stars you have made, billions upon billions of galaxies, uh, each with billions upon billions of stars. And yet the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How great you are, and so we bring you all of our worship and all of our praise. We thank you, Father, that you are our King, and that we are your people, and that you, as the King of all the universe, would give up your, um, your eternal Son to be our Savior, to pay for our sins of rebellion against you. This is, uh, this is entirely your grace to us, Lord God, and we thank you so much for your gift of your love in Christ, that Christ went to the cross in our place, that he would take our punishment upon himself. And Lord, we pray that we might praise you for this every day, and that we might live a life of true thankfulness, and that we indeed might learn more and more to abhor evil, we confess, Lord, that this is so often not the case in our lives and in our hearts. Uh, sinful desires arise within, and oftentimes we follow those desires and give in to them. And Lord, we pray that you will forgive our sins, but also cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we might serve you in holiness every day of our lives. And Father, we also come before you to be fed by you, to be fed in our souls uh, by your word. For Lord, we know that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so we pray that you will bless each and every one of us as we uh, open up your word this morning, work faith in our hearts. May we learn to trust in you, no matter what. And we pray, Father, that we might walk in your ways and give you the honor and glory that is due your holy name. Hear our prayer, and accept our thanks. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's sermon is Psalm 29, and that's going to be our, our reading, scripture reading. So we'll now read a Psalm 29. So Psalm 29, we're going to read the entire psalm. This is a psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf, and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. So far, the reading of God's holy word. Let's now... Uh, sing together uh, from hymn 13. This is a hymn based on Isaiah uh, 40. Also how uh, the God of glory and power uh, gives strength to his people. So hymn 13.
So again, the text for this morning's sermon is Psalm 29. We're not going to read that again as we just read it together, but you might find it helpful to uh, have your Bible open to Psalm 29 as we uh, go through the sermon. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a well-known song that many children love to sing that goes like this. Uh, My God is so great, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. I'm sure many of you know that song. I'm sure many of the children know that song. Um, Probably know the actions that go along with it. You can't really sing that song without doing the actions. Um, It's a simple song, but it's a good one. It teaches an important truth about our God. Our God is indeed so great and so mighty, and there truly is nothing that our God cannot do. And you can see something of this in our text this morning from Psalm 29. In this psalm, King David, he pours out uh, glory and praise to our God for his majesty, his power, and his splendor. Now, what kind of God do we serve? Do we serve a small God? Do we serve a God who gets frustrated because of his limitations and weaknesses? Well, certainly not. Psalm 29 is one part of scripture that tells us that we serve a God full of majesty, full of glory and power, a God worthy of all of our worship and praise. But that's not the only thing we learn about the Lord God in this psalm, and that's also a good thing. It's great to know that God is powerful, but power in itself doesn't help us. You know, there are many powerful things in this world that are only dangerous. A nuclear bomb is powerful, but it's not very comforting. But here we see not only God's power on display, but also how he uses his power to bless his people. And that's what we hope to see this morning from Psalm 29. So that brings us to the sermon theme this morning, which is as follows. The God of glory reveals his power through his voice, specifically. We're going to look at three things in connection with that theme. First of all, uh, we'll see how we give him. We are to give him right worship. And then secondly, to see the power of his voice. And finally, uh, we are to find strength and peace in him. So first of all, give him right worship. Now, David begins this psalm by calling out to the angels. And no, he's not praying to them, but he's calling out to them, um, calling them to worship Yahweh, the Lord God. Listen to this call in verse 1. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. And you can hear Uh, People in scripture do this more often, where they call to the angels, telling them to worship the Lord. Uh, One example is Psalm 103, where it says, Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of the Lord. And you can be sure that the angels do indeed hear this call to worship God. And they do this not so much because... We call them to do that, or, scripture call, or people in Scripture call them to do that, but because they are eager to worship the Lord. We get pictures of that at various places in Scripture. Listen to how this is described in Revelation 4. On the Apostle John, he sees a vision of God's heavenly throne room. He sees four different heavenly beings before the throne of God, and it says, day and night, They never stop crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They give to God right worship, worship that is due a God's name. But the angels in turn call on us as well to worship the Lord. 
In Revelation 21 and 22, an angel showed uh, the apostle John many glorious things. And John himself says, When I heard and saw these things, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Worship God. So as humans, we call on the angels to worship the Lord. The angels call us to also worship the Lord. That's what we were created to do. And so that call the beginning of Psalm 29. It's also for us. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. This is what you were created for. And in this, worshiping the Lord, you will find life's greatest purpose to bring him glory. And this will bring you true fulfillment and true joy. This is how, why God made you. This is what you were created for in this and listen to how high a calling this is too. It says, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Well, who is able to live up to such a high calling? To give God the glory due his name is to give him all the glory. It's to devote our entire heart and mind and strength to him. To, to direct our entire lives so that everything we do uh, brings God glory. Now, none of us here does that perfectly, of course. But by God's grace, by the work of the Spirit, we can do this more and more in our lives, directing our lives to His praise. And God is pleased when you, His people, aim to give Him this worship. He's pleased when we worship Him according to His word. You see, God not only calls Him, calls us, sorry, to worship him, but to worship him in the way his word uh, commands us to. We heard something of that in our call to worship from Hebrews 12. Uh, there it gave a one aspect of right worship. Acceptable worship, it says, is to worship God with reverence and awe. Right? That's, that's one thing God wants from us. Worship with reverence and awe. But our text adds one more thing to this call. Verse 2 says, worship the, the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Or as the footnote puts it, worship the Lord in holy attire or holy adornment. Now the Old Testament believers who read this psalm or sang this psalm, they might have first of all thought of the Old Testament high priest when they heard these words. Well, the Old Testament high priest wore special clothing in the temple service Clothing designed by God himself, it showed that he was set apart and devoted to this worship and service of God. One article of clothing was a turban on his head. Upon the turban was placed a golden plate. It was called the Holy Crown. Engraved on this plate were the words, Holy to the Lord. And it showed that the priest in his entire being, his entire service was for the worship of God and to bring him glory and serve him at that temple. Completely consecrated for this task. And for us in the New Testament, as New Testament Christians, we can think first of all of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. He was and is perfectly holy to the Lord. And by faith in him, we are united to him. And in this way, we have, uh, by being united to Christ by faith, we have clothed ourselves with Christ. And so we are clothed in the holiness of Christ by faith. And that's how we approach God in worship as well. In Christ, clothed with him, and, and it's in Christ that we can approach this glorious and holy God with freedom and confidence despite our many sins and shortcomings. But then this image also extends to us in our lives. Part of worshiping God with reverence and awe and, uh, and in spirit and in truth means adorning ourselves 
with holiness more and more in our own lives. We can hear that throughout Scripture too. For example, Ephesians 4 teaches us to put off our old self, which belongs to our old sin sinful way of living, the one that is corrupt through deceitful desires, to put that off. And then not only to put off the old nature, but to put on the new self, created in the likeness of God in true holiness and righteousness. So the image here in Ephesians 4 is a lot like a changing your clothing. Put off the old clothing of sin. Put on the new clothing of a holy uh, lifestyle. And so our worship of God is not just something we do here on Sunday, but it's our lifestyle uh, devoted to God. Think again of that, whole, that high priest uh, consecrated to the Lord and he had that nameplate on him, holy to the Lord, complete, completely devoted to the service of God. And that's who we are as Christians, devoting our entire life to God in holiness. As 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 puts it, Since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of, of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God, or out of reverence for God. That brings us to our second point. So the first few verses of the psalm gives us a call to worship. But at this point, Psalm 29 switches gears. Uh, verse 3 begins to describe a major reason for our worship. Why we bring God worship. And the reason given in this particular psalm is God's almighty power. And God's power here is revealed in a, a, a powerful thunderstorm. You know, there's not, nothing quite so fascinating as a good uh, thunderstorm. I love seeing them. I'm not sure how many thunderstorms you get here in, in Smithers during the summertime. I will say, um, back on the prairies, we got some real whoppers, and I love that. The entire sky grows black. Gale force winds start thrashing the trees. A torrential rains just come pouring down like you wouldn't believe. And then there's the best part, the lightning and the thunder. And every so often, you can get uh, lightning and then instantaneous thunder. And that's when you know the storm is, is really close. It's right on top of you. And when that happens, the sound is like nothing else. Sometimes we got some, some real house shakers where you could just feel it. Not just hear it, but you feel it. The, the mighty thunder of God. And that's the power described here in Psalm 29 with the power of God's voice. The God of glory thunders. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. See, God's glory and his power so clearly and wonderfully displayed in a, in a powerful uh, thunderstorm, magnificent. You know what the sad thing is? It's at these points w uh, in the world where God so clearly displays his creation, his, his, his glory, sorry. These points in creation where God so clearly reveals his glory and his power. But it's at precisely at these points, sadly, that humans uh, twist that and suppress the truth about God. Our Romans 1 says that instead of worshiping the one true God who reveals his power in creation, unbelieving humans exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. And sadly, that's so often what Israel did throughout their history. Read through the Old Testament, you can see that they're constantly chasing after idols instead of worshiping the Lord. And so often they worshiped the idol Baal. And for our purposes in this psalm, one thing we need to know about Baal is that Baal was considered the storm god. The god who was in charge of the storms. And so this psalm would have been particularly important for Israel to hear 
And the message to Israel is clear. Baal is not the storm god. He's not in charge of the storms or anything else in creation. Baal is a weakling. He has no power. And he cannot help you, Israel. You see, the powerful storms in creation are from the power of your God, Yahweh. And the power of his voice as he directs all things in creation. When he speaks, the entire earth shakes. So why, O Israel, will you follow Baal? Why would you put your trust in him? Why let an idol run your life? Why let an idol determine your choices? And when you follow Baal, O Israel, you are in slavery to a false god who will disappoint you. Baal cannot help you, and he cannot hear you, Israel. But the Lord can. By the power of his voice, he controls all creation. So listen to him. And serve him who has the power to help you every day. And that was the clear message to Israel. It's also the same message to us. Now we have that same message sinful heart as Israel. We might not worship Baal specifically, but we're prone to idolatry. So easily becoming enslaved to all sorts of things in creation that control us instead of having our lives devoted to God. Things that capture our hearts and push out love for the Lord. We can so easily put our trust in created things rather than the creator who's in control. But Israel needed to understand, and we need to understand, that any replacement for the one true God is going to sorely disappoint us. Only God, the Lord, has the power to fulfill all his promises. Trust in him. Only he can fulfill your true needs. Look to him in faith. You know, we get more revelations of God's almighty power in scripture. One statement I love is from Ephesians chapter 3. There it says, God is able to do far more abundantly than anything that we can ask or even imagine. Isn't that incredible? God can do far more, abundantly more, than anything that you can even imagine. That's incredible. That's the power of our God. And one way that God reveals that power to do far more abundantly than anything we can even imagine is through the power of his voice. And that message lies at the heart of this psalm. The voice of the Lord is specifically mentioned seven times, seven being the number of fullness. And listen again to the power described here, attributed to God's voice. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks or shatters the cedars of Lebanon. And this would have been an important image for, again, for Israel. The cedars of Lebanon, as we can see in scripture, were renowned for their their glory and their strength and their height. Imagine some of the old growth trees you can come across here in BC. Amazing how, how big they are. So these cedars of Lebanon were a symbol of grandeur and might, but God's voice breaks those towering cedars like they're little twigs. It says, a voice of the Lord also makes Sirion to skip like a young wild ox. Now, Sirion is another name for Mount Hermon in northern Israel. It was the tallest mountain in this region. So, in the minds of the Israelites, this was like their Hudson Bay Mountain, Sirion. Again, a symbol of strength and permanence. But this... So, supposedly, immovable mountain skips like a newborn calf at God's voice. And this power of God's voice matches with the rest of Scripture. 
Think of how God created the world simply by speaking. Let there be light. And there was light out of nothing. Think about how God revealed himself at Mount Sinai with the giving of the law in Exodus 19. And the scene in Exodus 19 is quite similar to this psalm. When God came down on Mount Sinai, there was thunder and, and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain with a very loud trumpet blast. All the people in the camp, they trembled in fear. Moses, too. It says Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because God descended on it in fire. And Exodus 19 says the whole mountain, it, it trembled greatly before the Lord. And when Moses spoke to the Lord, the Lord answered him in thunder. The people could not even bear to hear the Lord speak. It was so overwhelmingly powerful. And that power of God's voice continues throughout Scripture. And you know, it's also by understanding and seeing the power of God's voice that we can also recognize Jesus Christ as God's eternal Son. The one who is one with the Father of the same essence, has the same power. After all, he showed he had this same power uh, revealed in the rest of Scripture, such as Psalm 29. He had the same power in his voice. And there's so many examples we could pick from. For example, Jesus, of course, one time lay sleeping on a boat on the Sea of Galilee while a a storm raged around him and his disciples on that boat. When his disciples woke him up, Christ looked at the raging wind and the waves, and he called out with his voice, Quiet! Be still! And immediately the wind died down. And the waves obeyed the voice of the Lord Jesus. That was the power of his voice and still is. Another time a centurion asked Jesus to heal his servant. But he said, I don't even presume that you would come into my house. And what did he do? He trusted in the power of Christ's voice. He told him, just speak the word and my servant will be healed. He recognized that Christ had that power in his voice. Just speak the word. My servant will be healed. Well, Christ marveled at his faith and did this very thing. I'll give you one more example. Another time, Christ stood at the grave of his friend Lazarus. Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. But Christ called out to him, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, even as a dead man, arose from the dead by the power of the voice of the Lord Jesus. That's why Christ said also in John 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. So we see that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, one with the Father, has the same power. And this is also one way the power of God's voice and of Christ's voice is a comfort to us. For we trust in the power of Jesus' voice to raise us and all believers from the dead. You know, going into the grave is a bit of a frightening thought, isn't it? It can be very difficult to lay to rest a loved one as well into that grave. But we as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ enter into the grave in trust. God's eternal Son has this same powerful voice revealed in Psalm 29. And when he returns, the voice of the Lord Jesus will smash open tombs. The voice of the Lord Jesus will fling open coffins. 
And the voice of the Lord Jesus will raise believers from the dead and give us eternal life. That is the hope that we have in the power of Christ's voice. And that brings us to our last point. Well, Psalm 29 ends on a note of blessing. And this blessing comes to us from God our King. As verse 10 declares, The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as King forever. And listen to the wonderful blessings that flow to us as people through our King. It says, May the Lord give strength to his people. And may the Lord bless his people with peace. And this statement, as it's transla translated here, is a prayer of blessing. We could also translate it as is found in the footnote, uh, as a statement of God will, what God will do. The Lord will give strength to his people, and the Lord will bless his people with peace. And either way, the meaning is not uh, much different. In the central message is we find our strength, and we do find our peace in our Almighty God, in our King. A look at God's power again displayed in the psalm. Snapping mighty cedars like their toothpicks, shaking mountains by the power of his voice. And that reality, that power of God, calls us to find our strength in him. You know, when things are going well in life, when you're healthy and you're happy, it's so easy to trust in your own strength. Or, maybe to put it better, to believe that the strength that you have comes from yourself, comes from within. But it doesn't. Your strength comes from the Lord. Every breath that we pull into our lungs is a gift from God and his strength and power. Well, that's often how it goes when we feel strong. We forget that God is our strength. But when things do go wrong, when your health fails and things really get hard, that's when we come to realize that God is our strength every day. That's also why the Lord may humble us with weakness so that we do learn to rely on him more and more as we ought to do every moment of our, of our lives. But no matter what the hardship we face or pain or suffering, when this almighty God grants us strength, then we can go on in faith. Think of what we sang from uh, hymn 13 earlier. We can go on in faith with the strength God supplies. And sometimes our believers can go through really difficult things. Sometimes you wonder how they can do it. And you may wonder how you're going to go through uh, certain things that you're going through now. But the, re the reason any of us can persevere through suffering is because this powerful God sustains us. And that's why it's so good for us to know this God, as he's revealed himself in Psalm 29, can sustain us through anything in life. And so we learn to see he alone is worthy of our trust for life and breath and, and everything. So God blesses his people with strength. But there's one more thing. It says God also blesses his people with peace. And the peace here is the Hebrew word uh, shalom, a peace of the entire person, refers to wholeness or complete well-being, peace of mind and body and spirit. And you know what? As, I, as we read this last line of Psalm 29, this line might seem somewhat out of place in this psalm. For nearly the entire psalm, we've heard verse after verse of how God voice, his voice thunders, and how he shakes mountains, how he strips forests bare. It makes sense to find a reference to God giving his people strength in this psalm. But what about peace? 
it almost seems out of place. There's nothing peaceful about how this God, or how this psalm describes God. And we too, sometimes when we read about God's power and his holiness in scripture, might wonder how peace is possible for us in the presence of this almighty God. Think, think only of verse 7. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire, similar to what we sang from uh, Psalm 97, our first psalm. I don't know about you, but I don't feel much peace when I hear that or if I were to see that. I think about what Israel again experienced at Mount Sinai. Uh, when they heard God speak with the thunder, the last thing they felt in their hearts was peace. And so how can this powerful God grant us peace in his presence? It's by his grace in Jesus Christ. See, this powerful God has been working throughout history to bring salvation on earth through his son. And when the time finally came for his son to be born, he sent his angel, the shepherds, near Bethlehem to declare the good news. And the angel said to the shepherds, Fear not, I bring you good news, a great joy that will be for all the people. A Savior has been born, Christ the Lord. And after the angel gave that message, we see a choir of angels, a, a huge host of the heavenly multitude, who cried out, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. That's why God sent his son. To give us peace with God. <clears throat> and God has granted us peace between us and him through Jesus Christ. That's because Christ bore our curse. A curse that should have come upon us. He bore it for us on the cross. You see, without that sacrifice, you can be assured there would be no peace between us and God. That's because of our sins. But it's through that sacrifice that we have lasting peace with God. This is how it's put in Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have now been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in eternal life that we will experience this peace forever. Again, these things, God's power and this peace might seem radically opposed to each other. How could we ever be at peace in the presence of this God when we heard in the call to worship is a consuming fire? But when Christ returns, we will be made perfect and made fit to live in God's presence forever. And when that happens, we will experience a deep peace that we have never experienced in the here and now and will never experience on this side of glory. We will be with our powerful God and constantly surrounded by the safety of his protecting power. And when we are there, there will be nothing to harm you or hurt you. The devil will never attack you. There will be never anything to make you afraid or to, to disrupt your joy. But there will be peace forever. A perfect peace that will go on without end. Amen. Let us now respond to the preaching of God's word by singing of this psalm, a Psalm 29, we will sing all three stanzas.
In our prayer this morning, we will give thanks that this past Monday, our sister Jenny Boonstra could celebrate her 81st birthday. So we will give thanks for that. Let us pray. Our Lord God in heaven, we worship you. And we pray, Father, that we might do this more and more. Or we might worship you in holiness. We might worship you with reverence and awe. We might worship you with much joy in our hearts and also the peace that passes, surpasses understanding. Lord, we thank you that we can know you as our great and almighty God. Truly, there is nothing that you cannot do. And we thank you that you are able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or even imagine. And Father, may we rest and trust in you, finding our strength in you. And uh, We thank you that you have made peace between us and you. You have reconciled us to yourself through Jesus Christ. We thank you for this. And may we learn to trust the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ as well as revealed in Scripture. That we might know and believe and understand and be confident that even when we enter the grave or when we bury loved ones, we know that the power of Christ's voice will raise up believers from the dead and will give us never-ending life. And so we look forward to being in your presence forever. And as we await that day, will you grant us strength every day? And we pray, Father, that you will be with those who are going through deep trials in life. Sustain them, Lord God. We pray that you will uh, lift them up, grant them perseverance, we pray that we might all be a source of encouragement to each other, uh, encouraging each other to keep our eyes fixed on you and your promises, which are faithful and true. And Father, we pray that whether we are going through periods of weakness or strength, that we might all recognize and understand that our strength every day comes from you. We pray that you will continue to sustain us every day. We th uh, thank you for the birthday of our sister, Jenny Boonstra. Thank you that you have been with her this past year, and we pray that you will bless her in the coming year. Bless her together with her husband, Jerry, that they might continue to rely upon you, and that you will sustain their, their bodies as well. Grant them your rich blessing day by day, and may they continue to serve you in their lives. Will you be with all of our senior members Grant them what they need day by day as they face various challenges that come with older age. And Lord, we pray that uh, you will uh, be their uh, source of strength. We also pray for the process of electing new elders and deacons. Lord, we ask that you will grant uh, godly men to serve in these offices. And Father, we thank you uh, for those who serve in office Will you sustain them day by day? We thank you also for the announcement we could hear earlier of the uh, young people that wish to profess their faith before you and your church. And Lord, we thank you uh, for them. Thank you for working faith in their hearts and a desire to uh, serve you. And we pray that you will continue to establish them in the faith. And Lord, will you bless each and every one of them richly. Father, we pray that uh, you will grant us all what we need to serve you in this life. Father, will you bless our fellowship the rest of this day as well? And will you gather us in your grace again this afternoon? Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake alone. Amen. We will continue to worship the Lord through the giving of our offerings.
We will now sing our last song, uh, Hymn 73. We will sing stanzas 1, 2, and 3, and we will do so standing. Let's now receive the blessing of God's peace and faith and go in his strength and peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>